Introduction to Seizure and Epilepsy Diagnosis by Drs. Archna Patel, Lauren Sham, Agnieszka Kielian, and Leslie Hayes. This video is intended for primary health care practitioners in resource-limited settings and aims to be the initial steps in seizure and epilepsy diagnosis, including classification of seizures and initial workup to perform in children aged 1 month to 18 years. Neonatal seizures are evaluated differently and will be covered separately. Management of epilepsy will be discussed in another video. This video is intended to supplement the in-person training. The learning objectives of this video include, one, understanding the definition of seizures and epilepsy, two, being able to differentiate between provoked and unprovoked seizures, three, being able to differentiate between focal and generalized seizures, four, understanding which studies should be performed to guide management. A seizure is defined as a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. Although a complicated definition, simply put, this means there is excessive electrical activity, which clinically is seen as transient change in behavior or movement. In 2017, the International League Against Epilepsy updated the seizure classification guidelines, which used the onset of seizure as a first step in the operational classification of seizure type. This is why it is very important to gather information about how the seizure starts. According to the guidelines, seizures can be classified as focal, generalized, or unknown in onset. They can be further described based on what the seizure looks like. Focal onset seizures are those that start in one hemisphere of the brain. They can later spread to involve both hemispheres, but it is the beginning of the seizure and not the end that is the most important. Generalized seizures rapidly involve the whole brain. If the onset of seizure is missed or unclear, the seizure is of unknown onset. They can be further classified according to the patient's level of awareness, which can be preserved or impaired. To figure this out, you can ask whether the person seemed to know who they are and what is going on with the surroundings during the seizure. Awareness does not refer to awareness of the seizure occurring. Focal seizures can be further divided based on motor versus non-motor components. The final feature is whether the focal seizure evolves into bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. Focal seizures have signs and symptoms that reflect the part of the brain which is involved. The final feature is whether the focal seizure evolves into bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. A seizure which is generalized in onset involves both the right and left hemisphere at once. Similarly to focal seizures, generalized seizures are classified according to motor or non-motor manifestations. The motor manifestations can vary and include tonic-clonic, clonic, tonic, or atonic. The non-motor generalized seizures mostly refer to opsons seizures. In evaluating a child with seizures, it is important to determine if the seizures are provoked or unprovoked. Provoked seizures or acute symptomatic seizures are due to an immediate or transient problem. Examples include meningoencephalitis or encephalitis, acute stroke or head trauma, electrolyte imbalance or toxins, including alcohol or other substances. A history of injury to the brain months or years prior do not count as they are not immediate or transient problems. To identify if a seizure is provoked, you must pay attention to the details of the clinical presentation as the treatment is focused on treating the underlying disorder in addition to acute seizure management. Febrile seizures are important to distinguish from other provoked seizures as they are more common, carry a more reassuring prognosis and require less investigations. However, provoked seizures can also occur related to CNS infection in this age, and it is important to consider this in your evaluation. You need to be careful in evaluation to determine if the seizure in question is truly a febrile seizure. Febrile seizures must meet the following criteria. Presence of fever in a child between six months and six years, absence of a central nervous system infection, no prior history of neonatal or unprovoked seizures, no prior diagnosis of epilepsy, and no significant neurologic impairment. Febrile seizures can be further classified as simple or complex. Simple febrile seizures are generalized, last less than 15 minutes, and do not recur within 24 hours. 
On the other hand, febrile seizures would be classified as complex if any of the following are present. The seizure is focal, lasts longer than 15 minutes, or occurs within 24 hours. Please note that while complex febrile seizures can be focal, you must always consider a brain lesion if the child has repeated focal febrile seizures affecting the same side of the body. It is important to counsel parents that febrile seizures may recur again. However, the risk of epilepsy is only very slightly higher than the general population. The recommended workup for provoked seizures, including febrile seizure, is based upon the clinical appearance of the child. If there are signs of illness and poor feeding, consider checking a blood glucose and consider a sodium as well if there is dehydration or diarrhea. Lumbar puncture should be considered in the following scenarios. Any febrile child who appears ill and or with signs of meningitis, such as meningismus and headache, a complex febrile seizure, seizure in a febrile anemonized child, highly considered in children less than 18 months of age and absolutely in infants under six months. Children who presented with seizure and were started on antibiotics empirically for meningitis, based on ETAT guidelines. Lumbar puncture should be deferred if the child has signs of increased intracranial pressure, altered consciousness, focal neurologic deficit, signs of shock, any evidence of bleeding disorder, or an infection over the site of a lumbar puncture. If any of these factors are present, complications should be first managed and or neuroimaging obtained prior to the LP. Neuroimaging can have an important role in the workup of unprovoked seizures. Emergent neuroimaging should be obtained in any child presenting acutely who has persistent unresponsiveness, lack of return to baseline within a few hours, or a persistent focal weakness that is not resolving within a few hours. As timing is essential, the recommended study would be CT unless an immediate MRI is feasible. If the child is back to baseline, a non-urgent neuroimaging study should be considered for any child who has a focal seizure, focal EEG findings, significant cognitive or motor impairment without known etiology, or other unexplained abnormality on neurological exam particularly if unresponsiveness to anti-epileptic drug treatment or progressively worsening development is noted. The type of study depends on availability and clinical suspicion. In almost all cases, MRI would be preferred, with the exception of when there is concern for neurosister psychosis, in which CT would be sufficient and often more efficient to obtain. Outside of the instances warranting emergent neuroimaging, these studies are supportive and are not necessary in making the diagnosis of epilepsy or initiating medication. Identifying whether the seizure is provoked or unprovoked is important as this will guide your treatment. You should always treat the acute issues such as infection or injury in provoked seizures. Anti-epileptic medications should be initiated if treatment for status epilepticus was required. If you have loaded any child with phenobarbital or phenytoin, maintenance dosing of these medications should be initiated within 12 hours of the loading dose. Course of treatment for these medications in provoked seizures depends on the clinical scenario. However, it is recommended that the anti-epileptics are continued for at least the duration of the underlying illness and then tapered off slowly over a four to eight week period. For example, if a child has meningitis and is being treated for 21 days, the seizure medications should be continued for this time period at full doses and then weaned off over the following months, for a total of an approximately six to eight week course minimum. If there are continued seizures, the duration of seizure treatment can last months to a year. Please note that there is a high risk in these conditions for a future risk of epilepsy, particularly in certain infections such as cerebral malaria, Therefore, all of these children should be continued to be monitored clinically and families should be appropriately counseled. Febrile seizures, as noted previously, however, are an exception. These seizures should not be treated with daily medication, even though recurrence of seizure with fever may be seen again, as the overall outcomes are typically good. Counseling of possible recurrence and how to manage seizures at home and when to come in to the health center for care are the essential components of management. When there is no identifiable immediate and acute cause for the seizure, then it is considered unprovoked. Please note, unprovoked seizures may occur in a person with a history of brain insult, but the problem should be old, not something currently requiring treatment.
Unprovoked seizures are important to identify as they indicate a risk for epilepsy. Epilepsy, per the International League Against Epilepsy, is defined as either two unprovoked seizures separated by 24 hours or one unprovoked seizure and a recurrence risk similar to having two unprovoked seizures, defined as greater than 60% risk in the next 10 years. Key pieces of making a diagnosis of epilepsy are recognizing that there must be an unprovoked seizure and risk of future seizures, either by seeing at least two seizures or a finding on clinical history or exam indicating risk. Examples of risk include cerebral palsy, history of prior provoked seizures, and brain infection or injury. EEG is a helpful tool in determining risk of future seizures when available and can be performed after a first unprovoked seizure if feasible. However, it is not necessary to make a diagnosis of epilepsy, and diagnosis and treatment should not be dependent upon obtaining this study, particularly given limited access in many regions. To review, if a child presents with a first unprovoked seizure, you should first take a careful history and physical exam, performing laboratory testing if indicated clinically. If the child is not back to baseline, treat seizures as appropriate, investigate further, obtain imaging as indicated, and consult a specialist as needed. If the child is back to baseline, assess for a risk of epilepsy by your clinical evaluation and consider diagnostic testing, including EEG and neuroimaging. Again, these studies are not necessary for the diagnosis of epilepsy and should be considered supportive. Start appropriate anti-epileptic medications if you determine that the history indicates the child meets criteria for epilepsy due to risk by history or exam. All children with an unprovoked seizure, regardless if they meet criteria for epilepsy or not, should be seen for a review within three months to reassess. This concludes our review of initial seizure evaluation and epilepsy diagnosis. We will review seizure medication management in a subsequent video.